Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. It's so nice to see you and meet our new friends and celebrate this wonderful event with all of you. This happens to be one of my favorite holidays or celebrations. I like celebrations. And I find there is a lot of meaning today in our lives to focus on these topics. I'm going to talk from the book Teachings of Christ, Volume 4, and I'll cover Chapter 3, Seven Steps to Resurrection. I love these books. They're a series of four books that are a collection of everything Torquem Saradarian wrote about Christ. The birth, the teachings, the power of it, the parables of it, the resurrection of it. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I think it's very, very important. And the reason why I think these thoughts are very important is echoed in something that I read this morning from the Tibetan master's writings, and he said these teachings, these thoughts, are very important so that they impress our minds with certain ideas which are necessary for human progress. Okay, certain ideas that are necessary for human progress because we all want to progress. And resurrection is about overcoming the world. The world that holds us back, the material world, emotional world, mental thoughts that disempower us. That's what resurrection is about. And Christ resurrected and gave us an example of how to do it and gave us instructions. But not only that, but he said, I will remain with you forever. So he is engaged in the world, not disengaged. And that's very important for us. It's not just somebody out there somewhere. It is something, a process of becoming that is as real to us right now as it was 2,000 years ago or maybe 10,000 years ago. It's the same process of continuous growth toward perfection. Okay? The resurrection takes effort. Okay, it's not just going to happen by itself. It takes effort, takes energy, takes dedication. It's continuous hitting on that door to open, on that question to be answered, on that response that you need from life around you. You can't give up. If you give up, you're going to come back and have to do it again and again. That continuity is one of the most important things in the life of a disciple or any person aspiring to become a disciple, which is a person who is dedicated for purification, for the wellness of all. It takes tremendous labor so that eventually you are not trapped. Do we feel trapped? We do, of course, in our feelings, in our emotions, in our addictions, in our thoughts. Our minds just don't let us be what we want to be. Have you ever sat up at night and you can't turn off your mind? Well, it takes some resurrection, doesn't it, in order to turn that off. Within your emotions, your negative emotions, within your irritations and fears and wrong thoughts. So it takes effort, dedication, continuity. And one of the most important processes for that is to purify our mind, and that is what I'm going to focus on today. And purification of the mind is this continuous ability to think in reality. It's called meditation in some disciplines. But don't be afraid of the word meditation. Meditation means continuous thinking in reality, taking up to the reality of the next phase, of the next phase, of the next phase, of being conscious of what is going on in your mind. This is very important. Of course, we have also purification of emotions of our physical, but today we're focusing on the mind. Why is that? Because, look at this, meditation is mastery over your thought world. Through meditation, you conquer. Because when you put your mind into the reality of what is, then you change your life. You know cause and effect. It's staring you right in the face. You can't say, but, 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 on the other hand. You have to let it work through you, right? When you see reality, it has to work through you. Through meditation, you purify yourself. Through meditation, you build a path between you and higher sources. It builds a real thinker. When you are able to think clearly, it is so beautiful, so beautiful. Tibetan master says, already upon the mountains of initiation, the sound of his feet can be heard. It's not just some ephemeral thing that can happen. The Christ consciousness is coming to us. It is there for us. All we have to do is tune in with it. And through, so 
through our meditation, our focus, our concentration, what happens? A great path of light is created. Okay, think of this as a very organic statement. A great path of light is created by cooperative meditation, and along that path, speaking symbolically, the Christ will appear. So you make a path for that Christ consciousness by the way you think. Isn't that beautiful? So let's look at the states of mind that we can then see where we are and where we shouldn't be and where we want to be. There are seven states of mind that are discussed in this chapter. They're beautiful. The first four are states that we can see operating in us once in a while. Probably not 100%, but they're not the most desirable states to be in. Okay, and I'll talk about those a little bit. And you'll see how various times in your life you are really being pulled by those states of mind. And then the last three states of mind are the states of mind where you want to aspire to be in. That's where you say, I conquered the world. I can live in the world, but I'm not whipsawed by it. I'm not controlled by it. Because that is the image that we see. It's not just resurrection and moving out into the other worlds and never coming back and living in this world and thinking this world is a bad place. It's not. This is a beautiful place to live, beautiful place to learn, beautiful place to express your divinity. Where else would you express it? So that is very, very important to remember those two steps. So we are going to look at our mind today because the mind is the greatest trap for us for modern humanity. We already have a good idea how to be physically healthy, and we do it. All the information is available. Emotionally, we know we don't want to be toxic. But now we come to the mind. That's where the focus is for us right now, isn't it? You want to control that mind. So what is that first state of mind that we see, sometimes in us, maybe 1%, 2%, and then you see in mindless people everywhere? The first one is thoughtless state of consciousness. Thoughtless state of consciousness. Very, very dangerous. Not desirable state to be in. We obey the thoughts of other, others and we are like a machine. Now, there are great research that is being done by marketing people, advertising people, politics, religious people, how to manipulate people, right? And they know exactly when you do what. They know when you vote, how you vote, what you buy, when you buy, how much you buy. They taste, test and test and ask questions and do research and they know exactly how to manipulate our mind. And if we succumb to it, we are just like little machines doing exactly what the marketing people found out about us. We don't want to be there. If you don't want to be controlled like a machine by others, then you have to say, I don't want my focus to be on my little self. These are very dangerous people because they can be misused in any direction that they want. Mob mentality, mob anger, saying things that aren't true and, and you think they're true getting them all over the internet, newspapers, magazines, radios. You see that happening, don't you? Especially during what? Elections. Not just in the United States, really. This happens everywhere in the world because a thoughtless state of mind is everywhere. And it's sometimes in us, isn't it? That time you said something that you didn't mean. And you said it in a way that was nasty, unkind. That's a thoughtless moment. And you're going to catch those. How? By the meditation process, which is thinking. At the end of the day, you sit and think, what happened? Why did I hurt that person's feelings? I was unconscious at that moment. Do you see how it works? Okay, the second one. If we conquer the thoughtlessness and start to think, to use our mind, then we enter the second step, which is a natural step for all of us, which is called earthly thoughts stage. Earthly thought stage is when we think totally about our interests. Our body is important, our food is important, our drink is important. What we do every day, what we dress, how we furnish, it's important. And you can see that's not bad in itself because it's part of our responsibility, right? To take care of our property, our families, our wife, our children, our husband. We have to take care. But overemphasis, what happens? And that's all you think about. And the flip side of it is when we are in that earthly thought stage, we develop great fear. Do you see how that happens? 
we develop great fear because we're afraid of what is not earthly. What happens when I get sick? What happens when I die? What happens when somebody I love dies or I lose them? What happens when something wears out? You're in constant fear. And what happens when you're in constant fear? You get back to the first state, which is you can be very easily manipulated. Oh, we'll just wear this makeup and you'll be young forever. Wear, drive this car and everybody will love you. Do you see how we get whipsawed when we're in that stage? In itself, it's not a bad state to be in because it means you're responsible. You're a good steward. But you don't want to be there as an only focus in your life. Overemphasis and that leads to fear, foreboding, anxiety, sometimes self-destruction. Right? So this is very, very important. The third step is a stage of disintegrating thoughts. This is so important. And they're not sequential, by the way. These are things that we hook into depending on our subconscious recordings, our fears, the way we figure things out, the illogical way that we conclude about things. What is this based on? These thoughts are based on lies. Okay? Lies. Lies that you took for real as a child. Lies that other people made you believe. Lies that so cleverly you were manipulated to think are true. Lies that you think are real and they're really not. Not in the light of day. They are based on hypocrisy. They are not true. They are not real. They're made up. They're dangerous for you because they cut you off from what? Reality. From the reality. Do you see that? Don't succumb to lies. Always be welcoming and thankful for somebody who says, you're lying. Or they look at you in a certain way, you go, oof, what I said wasn't real. What I felt wasn't real. That was a lie. You see how important it is? Because you don't want to build your mental life on lies. What happens when that happens? Our brain gets disconnected. We get disconnected from otherworldly inspirations. Our mind, our brain is not functioning properly. It's half-baked. It's half-empty, half-connected, disconnected. It's all lies. Do you see how that works? You don't want to be in that stage. Always seek the truth even if it aches, even if it hurts, because what's hurting and aching? Nothing but your physical illusions and glamours. The truth, we're told, sets us free. How? by removing these lies from us. So don't kill the messenger. Don't say, I hate you because you made me see myself. In fact, get red-faced, get embarrassed, get humiliated. We're told to go ahead and be humiliated even. That shows when we're humiliated that we have a dichotomy inside of us and something inside of us realizes the truth, right? If you just felt nothing, Bah, it's all the same. Everything is relative. You don't know the lie from the truth. Well, there's no connection inside to something that's true inside of you. So when you feel humiliated, humbled, embarrassed, aggrieved by what you said, did, felt, the conclusions that you come to, apologize, correct it before it breaks your mental circuits. It's very important. A great one, look, now listen to this, this is so important, this is on page 52 in case you want to read it later today. A great one made a remark that the angelic kingdom decided to leave humanity because they said they could not breathe in this air, in this air of lies, and these decaying thought forms. When we don't have angelic beings inspiring us, we don't have a connectivity to the higher worlds. It is the angelic beings, the unseen helpers, who are always inspiring us and connecting us to the higher worlds. Does that make sense to you? You don't want to disenfranchise those wonderful helpers. They're the unseen helpers of your life. What are decaying thought forms? They are any kind of thought based on hypocrisy and lies and distortions. Anytime you read a lie, deny it. Anytime somebody sends you emails and stuff that are just made up say this isn't true don't take it in don't take it in and get it out of your mouth exactly the way you're brainwashed to think okay now this can happen a hundred percent 
or sometimes we believe our own lies, and those are the worst. We perpetuate our own lies. We may not believe somebody else's lie, check it up on Google and say that's not right, but we believe our own press, don't we? And that's the most dangerous, to believe our own lies. And this is very, very important. Listen to this, and I really am going to ask you to meditate on this statement. In the next week even, all the way leading up to the next big festival, which is the festival of Buddha, Vesak, this is when we make contact with the truth and reality. So listen to this. Nothing can live in the world if it has no life principle, if it has no truth within itself. Okay? If we want to live forever, be resurrected, have continuous higher experiences, we have to be in the life principle. That's what Christ demonstrated, that he let go everything that was not alive, and he lives in truth. These are the words that you hear in the sacred literature, and these are the metaphors that they remind us of. The fourth one that we don't want to be in is the state of ugly criminal thoughts. I don't think anybody has those intentionally here. I know we don't, but there are sometimes little damaging thoughts come to us. And what is criminal at the highest or worst level sometimes has a little needle in what we say or do, doesn't it? So think about those and catch them. These are thoughts that create distortions and remove the balance in, in space, the balance of energies, the balance of people's well-being and their health. So we have millions and millions of these thoughts and we see it everywhere. Great is the darkness, Tarkham says, and I follow thee, my lord. Darkness is everywhere and you follow that light. Always find that light that you want to find. And how are you going to do that? The next three kinds of mental states will help us determine what that means. So now we come to the mental states that we want to be in. Okay, the first four are depressing enough. Now let's think about the next three that are really beautiful. You can aspire toward these. Each one of us can do it. Why? Because Christ promised that if we do it, knock on that door and what will happen? It will open. You ask and you will receive. That's the law of nature. There's nothing that can hold that away from you. That is the promise. So the fifth level is called aspiration, worship, adoration, beauty. That's how your mind is inspired. Aspiration, worship, adoration, and by beauty. That's why we are told by all the great teachings not to diminish the beauty of people, not to put them down, not to make them cut them at their knees, because it takes away that mind that's aspiring. Every living being in the world, from animals, rocks, plants, human beings, angels, devas, great ones, all aspire toward what beauty and worship adoration, don't we? That's what we want. You adore beauty. Outside our window in our home, there's a mountain, and every morning we look at that mountain, and there's a little tree right on top of one of the highest peaks. That tree is the first to catch the light of the sun during half of the year. And we wait for that tree to catch the light and say, wow, look at that. It's just a tree, and it's just a sunshine. Big deal. But that brings the power of nature and the adoration of the universe in me and in our family. Do you see? And you do that yourself. You see something beautiful and you adore it. You adore its beauty and it's a very important part of your mental health. The sixth one is called beneficent thoughts. These are really, really beautiful. You are going to become more conscious of the beneficent thoughts that you put out every day. What are those? Blessings prayers, invocations, healing energies. There is someone right now that you know who needs healing and energizing energy, don't you think? Isn't there someone in all of your lives right now who needs your love and your healing energy? You can do that. You can send your beneficent thoughts. How can I help others? How can I make my life a service for humanity? Here your thoughts are totally fused with the great plan of the great ones the direction of the great ones, okay? You don't say what's in it for me. Say, how can I serve this person? How can I alleviate some pain in this person? How can I bring more beauty to that group or those people, or my children or family even? So you want to 
think of these beneficent thoughts on a daily basis. Why is that? Because as we think, we condition the chemistry inside of us and we attract the same. Okay? We are told to bless, to give, to serve, to heal. Why is that? Because it is good for everything, for you and for the recipient as well. So don't lose a chance every day to have a beneficial thought. And I'm sure you do when you get up in the morning and you pray. You pray at night. You send healing and loving energies to people. These are very important. And what do they do? They condition your mind with beautiful, connected neural pathways. It's very, very healthy for your brain, your physical brain, to have beneficent thoughts. Okay, so don't miss your opportunity every day to have some mental health by giving beneficial thoughts to someone, something, even great leaders, great movements, great servers. Send them thoughts. Now it's easy with social media. You can get on your Facebook, on your email, you can send all kinds of beneficial thoughts to all kinds of people. Why not? Instead of stupid gossip, ugly thoughts, lies and hypocrisy, we can flood we can flood our own, our own milieu with beneficent thoughts, right? It's not that hard to do. The seventh, which is the, the third of these wonderful thoughts that we should be conditioning our minds with, is creative thoughts. Creative thoughts. Do you know you have the power to create? Just your thinking? How does any discovery, development, Creative arts, speeches, books, architectural beauties, how do they come into being? By someone or a team of people, now more, more than ever, teams of people are finding ways to be creative, to find cures for cancer, to find ways to look at the cosmos, to find ways to use their computers and their knowledge better. People are thinking creatively, so you're going to have Creative thoughts. Creative thoughts are totally related to the purpose of God, the goal of life, the purpose of life. Why am I here? Okay, so big questions. Why am I here? What direction am I going? How am I going to build every year, every year, on this process of resurrection and changing my mind? This is when our consciousness starts changing. What is our consciousness? Our consciousness is the way we relate to the world. Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, in depth or in service. How we relate to the world. These are beautiful and I really, really love this chapter. And I'd like to read this one paragraph for you. Two paths are very important for the health and well-being of your mental state. One is meditation, which is deliberate thinking. The second one is to be observant. Observe yourself. Observe life. Observe nature. Observe how it works. Be awake so that you are not succumbing to the impressions of the media or other people who want to control you okay, by forces of matter. I know many, many people who entered into the path, and they were so happy that they were becoming initiates and masters. Even many disciples, after 10, 15 years, they came to me and said, Torkom, we are masters. We are great initiates. We are doing great works, teaching and writing, counseling, and becoming great ones. I asked, what is your focus of consciousness? One day observe it and find out, where is your consciousness? Okay. It's not enough to say you're something. You have to put the reality, reality check. Where is my consciousness? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I saying? What am I basing my conclusions on? Are they lies or are they truth? Okay, there's no reason why you can't ask yourself at the end of the day, was my day a lie or was it truth? Resurrection teaches us something very important. Resurrection says to us that there is no time there is no time. Have you figured out really how fast time goes? Have you figured that out? It goes so fast. You blink and it's 10 years later. You blink and you're old. You blink and you're gone. 
go so fast. You are going to work upon yourself. You are going to be serious. You're going to be solemn. You're going to take your own life under your own control, step by step, master it. You can do it. Because we have the example before us by all great ones. Today we focus on Christ. There are many great ones, and he shows us the example in today's focus, where billions and billions of people in the world are celebrating that today. So whether we understand it in Christian terms or esoteric terms, it doesn't matter. It is an individual who went and resurrected himself and became a path and an example for us. Isn't that beautiful? Are you ready for a nice meditation? We're going to do a nice meditation, relaxed. It is quite involved, but I will walk us through it. I'll guide us through it. And just relax yourself, put your stuff on the floor. And we're going to start with the great invocation. And we're going to say it slowly with concentration. And what is the great invocation? It is to impress the path through which light will come to earth from the highest source. Impress the path where love will come to earth. Okay. Impress the path where the great ones will guide us. And the fourth stanza, which is very important, impress to us our own responsibility in this process. And saying, let light and love and power restore that great connectivity, the plan on earth. And so when we say that, after that, we will say some ohms. I will give us a seed thought of meditation during which just very focused, don't let your mind go anywhere, respond to my questions in your mind. And when you go home, if you like, you can write some of your insights because meditation doesn't begin and end in a specific period. It continues and you'll see how your insights will come even more later on in the day as you filter through these thoughts. And we will do visualizations and you will repeat after me the mantra. After that, we will be singing Om Mani Padme Hum, and I will serve communion for those who wish to take communion. Okay, are you ready? All right. So sit nice and straight. Ah, take a deep breath and let all your troubles go. Put it all outside. Nothing matters right now. Put a nice smile on your face. Sit up straight. There you go. No worries. Put all your worries out of your mind. Some of you are still worried. Okay, nice smile. Take a deep breath. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of light within the heart of a God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center, which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth.
repeat after me. Salutations to the great resurrected one. Salutations to the great resurrected one. Oh. Now very seriously think about the following seed thought. What are the things that are hindering my beautiful thoughts? Name five of them. Now name five thoughts that you really want to cherish continuously in your mind. Five beautiful thoughts. See yourself being really spiritually beautiful, a very beautiful person. Just visualize that for a minute. Don't let any counter thoughts enter. Any way that you want to be beautiful. Visualize a book and open the first page, which is empty. Write something there, a decision, in your imagination. Put the date and time and sign it. Feel great joy in your heart. And express the gratitude to any one or any life condition that brought so much beauty and joy to you. Visualize a five-pointed star on top of your head, one foot above, a blue star. And that will be your guide to your soul or angel and to resurrection. Or imagine 
imagine millions and billions of people around the world. And as you repeat after me, think of the great beauty that's existing in every heart. The sons of men are one, and I am one with them. The sons of men are one, and I am one with them. I seek to love, not hate. I seek to love, not hate. I seek to serve and not exact due service. I seek to serve and not exact due service. I seek to heal, not hurt. I, I seek to heal, not hurt. Let vision come and insight. Let vision come and insight. Let the future stand revealed. Let the future stand revealed. Let inner union demonstrate. Let inner union demonstrate. Outer cleavages be gone. Outer cleavages be gone. Let love prevail. <coughs> Let love prevail. Let all men love. Let all men love. Thank you everyone for being here. I wish you a blessed Easter, a great process of resurrection and healing, expansion and joy and all the blessings of the great ones be on you and your family. Thank you for joining us. <coughs> if you have any questions or want to chit chat, we're available for you in the book room. So have a great day and enjoy your Easter day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.